Alhamdulillah. I know you're warm. It's okay. We can deal with it. Inshallah. Well, I don't think we're meant to have this many people in this space, so um, we'll just go ahead and give the HVAC system a, a pass. Inshallah. Um, so up until this point, who can remember the diseases that we've talked about? What are some of the diseases that we've talked about? Envy. Huh? Envy. Okay, envy was one. Okay. Miserliness. Miserliness, very good. The two types of thirst. Who? Two types of thirst. Okay, wow. All right, yes. What are those? Trying to prolong life. Okay. What else? that you're greater than Allah God is free. Okay. What else? Food. Overeating. That was probably like, I think people were like, that was the most impactful class people were like in tears we still are I know okay sorry I just had this huh heedlessness very good what heedlessness do you remember what it is what does it mean to be heedless huh yeah yeah to be like totally willingly neglectful which is kind of a weird way of putting it Okay, so those are all the diseases that we've covered. The reason why I'm bringing them up is because tonight's discussion is a combination of two sections of the poem that um, I didn't want to do two separate, it's just a lot to read, and so I thought that we would do, um, you know, one <coughs> section of it here, and then kind of go through the next section through the discussion, right, as the discussion goes forth. So... This section is called just beneficial actions for purifying the heart. Because we've covered up until this point, like, a, a, a plethora of diseases. And all of them are rooted in a heart that is diseased. Right? A heart that is, uh, that lacks, you know, it's, it's uh, any sense for being healthy. Right? There's no concern. One thing we've talked about with a lot of these diseases is that they're done with, like, reckless abandon. Like, it's not the same as a person who is sincerely trying to conquer them and is still being affected by them, but there's just a general sense of neglect, right? Um, almost like a person who doesn't care for their health or their finances or whatever, right? There's a sort of a, a sense of, of, of just neglect there. And so he gives us, in these two sections, beneficial actions for purifying the heart, and there's another section that he talks about. Uh, comprehensive treatment of the heart. Actually, you know what? We'll do this one, inshallah, because it includes the other one. So comprehensive treatment of the heart where he gives us, for all the diseases that a person can experience, for all the things that a person can go through spiritually, he says there are some, I don't want to say cure-alls, but there are some principles of spirituality that a person needs to adopt if they ever want to conquer themselves, right? So if a person ever wants to conquer these diseases, there are some things that a person has to master. They have to think about. They have to be able to do these things. Otherwise, all the diseases will basically ravage this person up until, you know, the heart dies completely, right? And so Imam Mawlid finishes this poem um, by giving us a sort of a, a holistic understanding of what it means to live a life of health spiritually, okay? So who wants to read? Let's have a guy, because we had girls the last few times, I want to be an equal opportunity employer. Any guys? Can, can you, can you see it from there? You can't even see it. Yeah. Are you sure? Are you the guy who shoots bank threes uh, from, the, from the corner, from the baseline? Okay, hold on. Oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. All right. Can you see it? It's a basketball thing. It's like shooting a three. Okay. So, the guy in the corner of the... It's a joke because that's where he is right now. He's in the on the corner. All right. Can you see it? Yeah, I Okay. All right. All right, everybody. Just one that. We're going to read. Comprehensive treatment for the heart. A comprehensive treatment plan for the heart's diseases is to deny the self of its desires. Okay, so he's saying that at the at the core of what is going to cure a person, at the core of it. Now we might talk about like all the tangents about how to get there. We might talk about giving charity. We might talk about uh, you know not showing off. We might talk about all the we're talking about all those solutions. But at the core of every single solution, according to Imam Maulid is that a person denies his self or herself of their desires. Whatever desires they have, they're able to deny themselves of this. So how does he explain this? Go ahead. Enjoy hunger, keep worship vigilance in the night, 
be silent and meditate in private. Okay. Also, keep company with good people who possess sincerity, those who are emulated in their states and statements. Mm-hmm. Uh, and finally, take refuge in the one onto whom all affairs turn. That is the most beneficial treatment for all of the previous diseases. So he gives a few steps here about how a person can stop their desires. What does it mean when we talked about enjoining hunger? Don't eat as much. Huh? Don't eat as much. Don't eat as much, right? So get a small, not a large. Yeah. Right? Get, uh, you know, get, maybe you can skip uh, a snack, right, in between the, the, the three meals a day or something like that. So enjoining hunger. Now, why does this, why does this in, uh, uh, increase a person's ability to conquer their desires? Being hungry. It's just like fasting. I mean, and then when you're keeping all of your stuff in check. Okay, so in Ramadan, you keep all your stuff in check. So when you're, you know, when you're hungry, but how does that have to do with hunger? Practice self-discipline. Huh? There's like nine different... Self-discipline. Self-discipline? Okay, very good. So self-discipline means what? Being able to tell yourself no. Okay. Even when you want to say yes. Even when you say yes, right? Okay. So there's two levels of discipline here that he talks about. And the first level is one that everybody should be able to, at some level, engage in. And that is a person who can tell themselves no with things that are impermissible. When we say the word haram in the Arabic language or in the Islamic legal, you know, terminology, it's not just forbidden, right? Like Allah doesn't just forbid things off of a whim. There's no like coincidental forbidding. Things that are forbidden by definition are things in the Islamic legal paradigm that cause harm. That's why they're forbidden. And even things that have some benefit, as, as is said in the Quran, even things that have like a slight amount of benefit, if the harm outweighs the benefit, right, then that thing is also deemed as impermissible because the harm is not worth, or I'm sorry, the benefit is not worth the harm. So whenever we talk about self-discipline and not doing things that are haram, it's not like, oh, well, here we go again, like, you know, all these uh, Islamic teachers and stuff, they always tell us not to do things that are fun, right? It's not what it's about. It's about, can, do I have the self-control to not harm myself, right? Because something, when it meets the eye, it looks tempting, my desires are intrigued, right? They're piqued. But if I engage in this thing, and this is actually, subhanAllah, very interesting. If I engage in this thing, the conscious that lives inside of me tells me that this was not the right thing to do. Right? This was not enjoyable. I was actually uh, sitting with somebody once a couple years ago in, uh, in a different city. And you know, he was telling me that basically he grew up in a very strict household. Okay, and I was like, join the club, right? So he grew up in like a really strict household, and he said that basically my goal, and he was telling me like his game plan. I grew up in a strict household, yeah, and my parents never let me like out after Maghrib because of shaitan. I said, yeah, <laughs> right, we've all been there. And then he's like, you know, so now I'm like 18. I said, yeah, he's like, I'm going to college. Yeah, he's like, I'm going to live it up. And he actually like specifically told me, and I was like, you don't have to tell me everything, it's kind of weird. Uh, but he told me about like, his nefsical aspirations, like what did he aspire to do when it came to pleasing his nefs. And it was interesting because a few months later, we basically met up in, under different circumstances, and it was close to Ramadan, and we were talking, and he essentially said to me that, yeah, that game plan that I had, um, I, every time that I engaged in something, at the moment leading up to it, whether it was going to a club, or being with somebody, or drinking something, or doing things I shouldn't do, the moments leading up to it were a lot better than the actual experience itself. And in fact, the experience itself followed with an incredible amount of guilt. And then he said that as time went on, I felt less and less guilt. And the point that he was speaking to me at months later was the time when he said, I no longer feel what? Guilt. guilt. So he was like, he, he kind of like shocked himself. Like, dude, I don't feel anything. I used to remember feeling bad, now I don't feel bad. I used to remember at least at least being like, oh man, I shouldn't be doing this. And now I don't even feel that. So he kind of was like almost scared. Like how do I regain the ability to feel that this is wrong, right? And this is what we kind of talked about in this whole session is that the heart's job is to let you know that something is not right. It's to alert you that something is right or not right. And the more that I engage in things that are not right, my heart loses the strength and the ability. It's almost like if you have a friend and you're trying to remind that friend over and over and over and over, eventually you're going to do what? You're just going to stop. 
Because you're just like, you're not listening. Imam Ali, radiallahu anhu, he says that, you know, knowledge, it calls out to action. The knowledge that we all have, it calls out to our actions. And he said that if action listens, the knowledge stays. But if action doesn't listen, he said the knowledge leaves. So essentially that person who came to me said that I lost the ability to feel that what I was doing was incorrect, right? And so having this ability to, to, to be self-disciplined, at the, at the outset it seems like, you know, man, this guy's like it's a Muslim boot camp or something, right? Not that kind of Muslim boot camp for the CIA who's listening. Uh, <laughs> but it's like some sort of like, wow, this is very like strict and whatever. It's not, it's not about that. Spirituality is about having the ability, number one, at the base level, to not do things that you know that Allah has advised against or commanded against because it's detrimental to, to us, right? You know, if a person lies, right, if a person lies on their, in, in school, if they cheat on their, uh, on their homework or their labs, right, like they copy, right, why is that wrong? Why is it wrong to cheat on something in school? Like, does it affect anybody? Yeah. Like, if I copy... Well, calm down, curve, curve crazy people, right? Okay? I'm talking about, like, without curves, which are just, like, ways that we deal with, uh, I don't know, like, poor grading, I guess, but, you know, or poor grading systems, right? Standardized grading. Uh, if, if I cheat, if I copy my classmate's lab, right, or if I, if I pay someone to write an essay for me, is that, is that affecting anybody in the cosmos? Like, does anyone say, ow? Okay, curve people, calm down. They're like, yes, right? You don't understand the curve. Right? I do understand the curve. The point being is that, no, it doesn't. Like, the teacher is unaffected. In fact, the teacher might be like, good, another A, like, less red ink, right? But then when it comes to the standardized exams and the scores are down, right? But, or the other student, it doesn't affect anybody, really, right? If a person goes online and finds the answers and copies them down, but what has that person done? What have I done when I've cheated yet? You've affected yourself. How? You've you sound like you're about to go off, by the way. <laughs> okay, you're a teacher. Very good, mashallah. Tell me. Tell me. You've affected yourself from your ability to learn something new. You've deprived yourself of new knowledge. What if I learn it later? It doesn't matter. You don't know what you could have possibly learned then. But what if, what if I learn it later? It's worth it. I agree with you, by the way. I'm a teacher, but I'm saying... <laughs> you're still depriving of yourself, like yourself of something now. Okay, very good. So you're, you're losing out on an opportunity, right? Yeah. To gain something with merit, with actual integrity, with sincerity. But what's deeper than that? Cheating. Not just yeah. academics, because I can learn it later. Maybe the test is tomorrow, and, and I know the final is going to have it on it, so then the next few weeks I kind of brush up on it, right? Which, by the way, a lot of us are like, he knows, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, look... But what have I done to myself? What have I done to my, to my iman, my, my heart? You've normalized the negative actions. Uh, I've made cheating something that's not big of a deal. It's not a serious issue, right? Sorry, is that my son? Oh, right? I've made, I've made cheating not a big deal. So then what happens? What happens is, you know, I start to buff up my resume a little bit, right? I start to say, well, I was, you know, I was a part of the MSA, but let me just write MSA president. They'll never know, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, for the for the med school app or whatever. And then, when I'm doing all that, the interview, they're like, so tell me about your experience as MSA president. You're like, well, actually, it was the first ever MSA in the history of the college, right? <laughs> and they're like, whoa! And you're like, yeah, I'm kind of a pioneer, right? Like, and then it keeps going. And then, you're applying for jobs, and you start to maybe, bu- you know, bump up the resume a little bit there. Well, I only worked for a couple years, but let me put five years on there, right? There's actually, like, individuals who are... You know, uh, they have, like, friends be, like, the CEO of a company that they worked at, right? Again, this is all very standard practice. And I want, I'm not trying to be dramatic, but I want you to think about how does this eventually translate, you know? And all my, all my UTD peeps, like, you guys are, this is a revision for you because we covered this in Surah Fatiha. What happens eventually is that a person becomes so comfortable lying, because that's what cheating is, right? It's lying. You're putting your name on something you didn't do. A person becomes so comfortable lying that what's the difference between lying to a teacher and lying to your boss? And that eventually lying from your boss to lying to your spouse. Now, I'm not saying, like, necessarily cheating, 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 but maybe it's like, hey, where were you? You said you were going to come home. And it's like, oh, sorry, I got late at work. When, in fact, you weren't. You were just playing Fortnite, right, at work, right? <laughs> or maybe it was like your friends wanted to go out, and you're like, sorry, I have a meeting with some people on my team. Like, we got to finish this big project deadline by next week. And you go out and you play Fortnite. No, I'm just saying, right? You do something, right? And then eventually, 
And I'm not trying to be dramatic, but look at how the... Because Shaitan, like the reality is Shaitan doesn't just come at you with like the big deal. Shaitan doesn't come at you and say like, hey, I think you should commit shirk. Right? You're like, okay. Like, I think you should worship something other than God. Does that sound cool? You're like, Shaitan, what the heck, man? Like, you lost that, bro. Like, you know? What happens is there's a slow degradation of the person's ability to feel what's right and wrong. It's like a slow chipping away at a person's ability to feel. The heart loses its ability to warn the soul, hey, this is, there's something wrong here. There's something going on. So then a person goes on years, and when I talk about this, think of your academic career all the way to your professional career. Some of us have mastered cheating for like a decade. I'm being serious. Like we're laughing because it's actually funny, but think about this. We've actually figured out systems and we've passed them down. We've like given ijazah to like <laughs> underclassmen. <laughs> On, like, what labs are going to be available, and, like, where to find them, and, like, who to pay. And this passes down, and it's interesting, because we've codified a system that, in its essence, is rotten. We've codified it, and we've formalized it, and we've now taught it and passed it down, like it's some sort of academic heritage. And, it, and we wonder why there's so much, you know, infidelity in the world today. We wonder why there's so much white-collar crime in the world today. We wonder why there's so much theft. It's because we've made cheating a part, a very fabric of our cultural experience. That the smart kids, and it's not just like, you know, the quote-unquote not smart kids. It's everybody who does it in school. So think about these diseases of the heart, the reason why they're detrimental is because they start off what seems to be like innocuous, like benign. Okay, well, it's only affecting me. Who cares? It's not your problem if I cheat. But then what ends up happening is the person then, like, say that to the person, say that to, like, the brother of the woman that was cheated on. It's not your problem that I cheat, right? Say that to the, to the sister or the brother of the husband that was cheated on. It's not your problem that I cheat, right? It started off being an individual thing, and then it's grown. So self-discipline with things that are impermissible, it seems like it's just an individual thing. But in reality, there is a ripple that affects everybody, and we have to be concerned with this, right? We have to be concerned with this. So enjoining hunger is when a person stays away, not only, all of these things, by the way, they have uh, levels. So the first level is being self-disciplined from things that are impermissible. What's the next level, you think? Being self-disciplined from things that are what? Permissible. Permissible. Like, you're allowed to have it. And actually, you could argue that that one's more challenging. Because things that are impermissible, at least there's this sense of guilt that's like flooded over, right? Well, this is haram. I'm going to get sinned if I do this. Hellfire, etc., etc. But things that are permissible but I have to be able to hold myself back, there's no other motivation for me except for the fact that I should be doing this. Okay? So what's an example of this? Overeating. Overeating is probably like the number one one that we're going to talk about, right? Overeating, so like not having that second plate at a thought. Okay? Not having that second slice of cake. Not having that extra spoon of sugar that you know you shouldn't need, right? What else? Let's use some other examples. Huh? Raise your, raise your hand, huh? <laughs> What did she say? What did she say? Uh, okay, so since this apparently struck a chord with so many people, let me address this. She said not having four wives. First of all, this is a practice of the Prophet Sallallahu that's sanctioned by the religion. We don't make a mockery of anything, even if we ourselves don't find it to be something that we desire as a, as a community. I have zero interest in having more than one wife, right? I have zero interest. However, I don't mock something that was practiced by our tradition. At all, because it's a different it's a different experience, a different culture, etc. At the same time, I don't use the tradition to bully my wife by threatening her and saying I'm going to marry another person, right? Because that's also garbage. Okay. Not because your wife is here. Huh? <laughs> no, and this isn't an open mic night. No, I don't, I, and we don't joke about these things. I don't, I don't make jokes. There's no joking in the religion about marriage or divorce, according to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, so let's all really quickly say A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. This is something that we don't make a mockery of. And yes, you're right. Perhaps, perhaps a person is interested in marrying more than one for whatever reason, right? But yes, there is some indulgence there that they might have to hold themselves in with, okay? Just like any other indulgence that they might have. But just let's get the point across. We don't make jokes about these things, okay? If a person's serious about it, then that's their prerogative, okay? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, by the way, every woman he married besides Aisha was previously married. Okay, so if you want to have more than one wife, then why don't you go look for individuals who actually would 
sincerely like maybe aren't on the market in that way instead of trying to you know flex it to your wife to try to like encourage whatever or like threaten her or like leverage right we can talk about this all day but the point being is let's not make a mockery of it at the same time let's not make threats out of it okay um let's move on yeah you had your hand raised yeah yeah when somebody um, puts too much focus on worshiping and disregards their family's needs and stuff, so they stop paying attention to their wives. Yeah, okay. Or they're, Yeah, so like when a person, it's, permi- it's, it's permissible for a person not to go to the masjid 40 minutes early for every salah. It's permissible, yeah. right? Or it's permissible for a person not to pray, you know, 20 rakats all week if they don't want to, right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes there are moments where it's actually better to not do what's permissible because maybe there's something more uh, noble, like spending time with your kids. Like maybe bath time and story time with Musa is better for me than teaching another halakha right after this. Right? Even though someone's like, oh, a'udhu billah, you should teach as much as you can. No, dude, like, that's my student, right? I have to teach him. And it's kind of weird because he's naked in the bath, but you got to teach it, right? Okay? So absolutely, there are some areas where we, where we dial back. The, the, and this is oftentimes self-control. And that's a very good example. Maybe someone's offered more time at work for more money. Maybe there's like a shift they can pick up. But maybe their family is at home wondering where they are. Like, where's mom? Where's dad? Or your parents, right? You can work on a holiday weekend, but your parents want you to come visit. Like, I could either, like, you know, get time and a half, or I could spend time with my parents, right? That's a permissible thing that might actually be beneficial if you show that self-discipline, okay? So there's the things that are impermissible and the things that are permissible. So enjoin hunger... Keep worship and vigilance at the night. Meaning, give up what? What are you giving up? Sleep. 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 Very good. Be silent. What are you giving up? Talking. Slandering. Talking. Slandering is one, but what else? Arguments. Arguments. What else? <coughs> what are some other things that we just like to do? Pride. Huh? Gossip. Who said pride? You said pride. Well, how do we give up pride? Well, if you want to be right all the time. Okay. Yeah, so remember, is it's impermissible to get to slander and gossip, right? So that's the level of impermissibility. What about permissibility? Is it halal to share your opinion? But sometimes you just shouldn't. Right? Sometimes like, oh, I got to keep it real. Sometimes, no, you don't have to. Right? Okay? And sometimes it's even when you know things are correct. The hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he says, I promise a palace in the middle of paradise for the person who gives up arguing even when they know they are correct. So sometimes not sharing your opinion is a way of keeping that, right? A way of showing that self-discipline. And the last one is meditating in private. We'll talk about that. So some of the scholars of Tezkiah, they say that there's three things that you should master if you want to be a spiritual person. If you want to be a person who is spiritually, you're oriented towards, you know, spiritual north. Number one, they say, is, and it's mentioned here, that you should shorten or uh, lessen your food, and you should lessen your sleep, and you should lessen your speaking. Food, sleep, and speech are the three things that we have to be very vigilant over if we want to be able to exercise this self-control. And if you look at the era that we live in now, I don't think it's unfair to say that we are in an era that eats a lot, that sleeps a lot, right? Like, whenever we can, right? Sometimes I'm excited to fly just so I can sleep, right? And that speaks a lot. Like, these are the three practices that probably defines our generation, right? Foodies, we we literally have memes about our, about like falling in love with pillows, right? Okay? Like, like, like there was a meme the other day where a guy was hugging his pillow and he said, no one will ever understand me like you, right? An example. And then you have just have Twitter. You just have social media, which we are all maybe guilty of at some point or another, right? So too much food, too much sleep, and too much talking. These are the three things that our traditional scholars have said, if you want to really become a person of, of self-discipline, that you should master these things, okay? How do we do this? He says, keep good company. Keep good company with good people who possess sincerity. You know, Islam is a faith that cannot be accomplished alone. Part of the reason why we're so focused on building community here is because you experience things together and you meet people and learn things from one another that you would not be able to come about if you came by yourself, if you tried to read this by yourself. So many people, probably 10 or 12 people have come up to me and been like, I've read this book. And they're like, I've read it by myself. But it's not the same as when we all discuss it together. This is what they're saying. I'm not saying that, right? They're like, it's not the same as when we all discuss it together. 
Part of it is that, yes, we may have some nice insight that maybe someone else provides, but the other half is that this is what we call barakah. What's barakah? Blessing. Blessing. What's blessing? When you ask Allah for barakah on something, what are you asking for? Goodness. Guidance. Okay, to make something good for you. But isn't that just like goodness? Like, don't we ask Allah, just make it good? Give me khair. So why, what's barakah? What makes barakah so different? Huh? It can multiply. Okay, explain. It can multiply, she said. Just adds up like more people here, you know. Adds up with less what? With the same amount, but there's more. Ah, very good. It's more qualitative with the same quantitative. So we ask Allah, if I ask Allah for barakah in my food, what I'm saying is, oh Allah, on my hungry days, I need X amount of pizza to be full. Right? I'm not trying to make any, not trying to throw, throw shade here, right? <laughs> I need X amount of slices to be full. Oh Allah, put barakah in my food. And one slice, how Allah will keep you full. Mm-hmm. That's barakah. Barakah is, oh Allah, I'm running low on gas this week, and I don't got money to make ends meet. Oh Allah, put barakah in my car. I actually had a friend who used to make this dua every time he got into his car. And he already had a Civic, so there's already a lot of barakah there, right? <laughs> but... But at the same time, wallahi, like I can tell you with my own eyes, we saw this dude, he lived very far away from us in Chicago. We saw that he filled up less than us and he drove everywhere we drove. Because barakah is a real thing. It's not fake. It's real. There are times when you feel like you slept for a few hours and you're like, man, I feel like that was, like, I feel so rested. And there are times where you slept for like three days, right? (laughs) You turned into like Ashab al Kahf, like you slept forever. (laughs) Right, people of the cave, and you wake up and you're like, I'm still groggy, I'm still tired. That's the absence, perhaps, of barakah. There's paychecks that you get from work, where you feel like it's just lasting, right? And there's paychecks where you're like, what happened, right? It's gone before it even touched my hand, okay? So that's barakah. That's why you should always ask Allah to increase in barakah. Spending time with people, spending time with people who you become better with, that's barakah. Because your time is not wasted. What normally was an hour, when you spend it with somebody who's good for you, someone who reminds you to do good, someone who reminds you to call your parents, someone who reminds you to pray, someone who reminds you of Allah, that time, that one hour, becomes like a lifetime of khair for you. And the proof of this is that you will learn something in a conversation with somebody, and that thing will last you the rest of your life. That's blessing. That's a blessed relationship. That's why the Prophet ﷺ, who is the most blessed person, his relationship exists till today. All over the world, we are all quoting him as if we're homies. Like, I'm talking about, like, hey, one day the Prophet said, it's like, you never met him, dude. Like, why are you talking like that? That's the barakah of the Prophet. You feel, and that's why if anyone here has ever been to Medina, you actually feel like perhaps you've met him. You feel close to him, even though you've never met him. Even though you've never actually physically met him. So, the more barakah a person has in their life, the more quality they have in their life. The more things will last for them. So, keeping good company with those who possess sincerity. Those who are emulated in their states and statements. What does that mean? He just defines sincerity for us. What does it mean to be emulated in your states and statements? Yeah, you're the same person in real life that you are on the internet, basically. Right? You're the same person in that what you say is also who you are. So you talk about being good to people, and you're also good to people. You talk about generosity, and you're also good to people. Now you understand, by the way, the wisdom in speaking less. Because there's less expectations for you. If I talk a lot, that's why my life sucks, dude. Because I talk all the time. And then I go home and I'm like, i got to do so much, right? Because I just told everybody to do all these things. If I don't live up to it, that makes me a hypocrite, right? So the more that a person speaks, it's actually not a position of honor. It's actually a position of accountability. That there's a lot more that they have to be asked about. So if I sit here and like to share my opinion about everything, but then I can't deliver on those things, I'm not a person who's the same in state and statement, right? So be a person who's the same in state and statement. It sounds like one of these new... Warby Parker Company, state and statement, right? <laughs> we make mattresses. Uh, okay. So, and finally, take refuge in the one until whom all affairs return. That is the most beneficial treatment for all the previous diseases. I want to go to the next section's poetry because I feel like it really would benefit all of us, inshallah, to read it as we conclude. So these are some beneficial actions now. That was kind of like the big picture. Next, he gives you some things that you can actually do uh, in terms of, you know, I'm sorry, the other one was kind of like actions. This is kind of like the philosophy of how you should act on them. Okay, so continue. Who wants to read? Uh, As for action that is beneficial in purifying the heart, none is more effective than what is consistent, even if it is slight. What does this mean? 
do it all the time. Don't give up on it. Okay, don't give up on something. What does he finish, though, with the, the sentence with? Even if, it's like, even if it's a little bit. Yeah, and he takes this from the hadith of the Prophet Wasallam, where the Prophet Wasallam said... Okay, we're not all going to look at you filling up a couple of <laughs> no, 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 no. right? Okay, sounds like a car engine. Uh, <laughs> so, the hadith of the Prophet Wasallam, where Aisha said... What the, the, he, you know, he was asked, or she was asked, you know, what was the most beloved of actions, and the Prophet yeah. ﷺ responded by saying that anything that is consistent, adwamuha wa inqal, even if it's a small amount. What is this te- teaching us about consistency and faith? Like, what is the relationship between being consistent and being faithful? You need a routine. Hmm? Like you, you have to make it a routine almost. Okay, and what do you make? What makes it into your routine? Tell me about your routine, guys. What do you do for routine? What does your routine include? Working out. Working out. Praying. Praying. Okay. Well, let's go with working. Okay, so working out. Praying. Brushing your teeth, you said? Yeah. Okay, everyone, we good so far? <laughs> Brushing teeth, okay. What else? What else do we do? Coffee in the morning. Eat, okay. Anyone coffee is part of your routine? Oh, God. Okay, what else? Huh? Studying. Anyone studying? Going to work, part of your routine? What else? Calling your family? Talking to friends. Who, who calls their family and they feel like, alhamdulillah, I call them, you know, a good amount? Who, be honest, who feels like they can call more? Do you want to know the truth? And I'm with you, by the way. My mom is definitely watching. I'm with you. You know what that means? It means that deep down inside, even though we might say it, they, the things that we could do better on, but we just don't quite get there for some reason, it's just simply not a priority. It might be a priority in theory, but the land of theory is very far from the land of application. There's oceans that separate those two things. Theoretically, I know that I should be good to my family and call. In application, I'd rather listen to this podcast. Or I'd rather call somebody else. Or I'd rather just drive in silence. And there might be some issues that are holding us back, right? I'm not talking about those exceptional issues. But what I'm saying is, we can tell a lot about ourselves by what makes it into our routine. Mm -hmm. What makes it into the routine? You know, whenever somebody says, I don't have time for this, the reality is, everyone has the same amount of time. And the, the challenge about time is, what do you take out to put something else in? Right? If I have time for Fortnite, or if I have time for the NBA playoffs, or if I have time to go shopping, or if I have time for whatever, whatever hobby that we all have, if I have time to spend time dialing in an espresso machine and nobody can even taste the difference because you guys put three pumps of mocha anyway, right? <laughs> okay, I'm just joking. It still is good coffee, don't worry. Then if I have time for that, then I can definitely make time for other things. I've just chosen to make time for certain things and not chosen for other things. So consistency is not something that is incredibly difficult, but it's still miraculous. Being consistent is actually extraordinary. Because all of us feel, in Ramadan, this spiritual boost, right? Like, I've actually, I'm part of some WhatsApp groups. Alhamdulillah. (laughs) (laughs) Got friends, right? Okay, so, I'm part of some WhatsApp groups where people are already making plans, like, that involve tarawih. So, whereas before it would have involved, like, a movie, now it's like, alright guys, let's meet at my place, break fast, we're going to go over here, get some of this, and then we're going to go pray 20 rakat, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas before it would have been like, let's go eat, and then go see a movie, and then go have coffee afterwards or something. People are actually choosing to involve taraweeh. Ramadan is a time that shows you your capacity. After Ramadan is a time that shows you who you really are. Because we all increase. And by the way, the phrase Ramadan Muslim, how many of you have heard that before? It's a beautiful phrase. We are all Ramadan Muslims. We all somehow, some way, get better in Ramadan. Even if it's simply just by staying away from food and drink, which is no small task. But to stay after Ramadan at that same level is so extraordinary that, check this, the Sahaba said that one of the signs that Allah has accepted your Ramadan is that the actions you did in the month live on after it's done. So like, if I'm able to catch Fajr every day for 30 days, and I'm able to pray Fajr every day for 30 days, if the first day after Ramadan, I miss it, then I know that there was something deficient in my priority. Maybe I was more interested in Suhoor than I was in Fajr. 
and Sahur was just kind of like, you know, Fedra was just kind of like, okay, well, I'm up. And it's weird. Because the four Adan clocks are going off, right? The one upstairs, it sounds like my grandpa's calling Adan, right from the attic. I better pray. Otherwise, I'm going to be like a really bad person if I go to sleep and I'm like, you know, the angel's just like, what's wrong with you, right? Looking at me. So maybe I was more interested in Suhoor. Or if I prayed Qiyam every night in Ramadan, like I was up and I made it to the masjid and I prayed Tarawih and everything, and then after I don't do any extra prayers, maybe it was simply the social effect of me being with my friends. And it wasn't actually me being interested in that. So being consistent, even though it sounds like a really simple thing, it's actually very miraculous. You will hear some scholars that will say things like, uh, so-and-so person never missed a takbir of prayer at the masjid for 40 years. If I told you, like, hey, this person lifted a car, you'd be like, wow! But if I said, hey, this person prayed for 40 years at the masjid, you'd be like, that's like my dad. That's like my uncle. But I want you to think about the miraculousness of never missing a takbir at a prayer for 40 years. How amazing must that person be? Anyone here, are, do you have a Netflix? You guys seen Jiro Dreams of Sushi? You should watch it. Jiro Dreams of Sushi, if you like sushi, then mashallah, right? If you don't, then may Allah guide you, right? <laughs> so Jiro Dreams of Sushi is about this guy who's like, you know, in his 60s or 70s. He's just, he's just basically this master sushi chef. And his sushi restaurant is in like a small little corner of a train station in Japan. And the reservation list to get in is like three years. So if you want to go in 2021, let's call, right? And then we'll go. And they interview him and they document like, why is your stuff so remarkable? And they obviously did the whole thing about, well, we get good, good ingredients, but those ingredients are available to everybody. And they said, well, you know, we kind of have this hype. Well, you know, you can create hype, Instagram, right? What makes you so special? And they basically find out that it is this guy's consistency. You know how consistent he is? He takes the same train every morning at the same time. Not only that, not only does he like wear the same clothes, he does the same thing, he stands on the same square in the train station on the platform waiting for his train. The same square. Imagine the awkwardness if there's somebody else there. <laughs> it's like, uh, it's been like 40 years, it's my square, right? At this point, it might be like Maqam Ibrahim in Mecca where like his footprints are there, right? Like, they're just there. And they ask one of his, uh, his sous chefs, they're like, okay, so you're the guy who makes the rice, you know, for sushi. And he's like, yeah. They're like, how long do you have to do this? Like, what's the process? Like, how long is your position here before you move up, climb the ladder of apprenticeship? He goes, oh, like seven years. Making rice for seven years. He has to make rice for seven years. It's the same process. It's the same ingredients. It's the same everything. For seven years, makes rice the same way. Why? Because doing something once is nothing special. It's nothing special. Anyone can wake up and break the am once. Anyone can fast once. Anyone can pray for once. Who can do it for their entire life? So the Prophet them said, be consistent in qal, even if it's in a little bit. So we feel a little bit overwhelmed. Oh my God, be consistent. I don't know if I can do everything like that. That's why he said, even if it's a tiny bit, you don't have to master everything. You don't have to be amazing at everything. Just be amazing and consistent at something. At something, yeah. Like about that comment, like Islam in the end is more about like the effort that you're putting in, so like consistency. Yeah. That's just like a testament of like the effort that you're putting in, no matter it's not result oriented. Yeah, it's yeah, it's not result. Well, we don't control the result, right? So if I want to donate, if I show up and I want to donate something, and they're not taking donations, which is never going to happen in a Muslim organization, if I'm going to do that, right? Or if I if I want to do something good and there's no opportunity for it, I still get rewarded for the intention. The result oriented, yeah, exactly. We're not result oriented faith. We're process oriented. Do the thing, right? And let Allah handle the success or the quote unquote failure. Okay. So even if it's slight, include also action. Continue. Include also action that is done in the absence of witnesses. Or actions purely for his love or out of awe of his majesty. So what is he saying to do here? To not vote. That's level one, is don't talk about it. And this is, by the way, something very important, because for the young professional demographic, this is how you fail at your job. How you fail in getting promotions. How you fail in succeeding in your respective field is you hide your achievement. Like, we have to show our achievements in the corporate world. You have to talk about them. 
you have to basically flaunt. I mean, li- what's LinkedIn, dude? What is LinkedIn? It's just it's basically documenting your achievements and sending them via hyperlink and saying hi, right? Look at me, right? And that and that's part of what it means to be successful. And by the way, not not a bad thing. It's part of the system. But the strange thing and the difficult thing is that success in the afterlife is the exact opposite modality. So the afterlife is not about sharing all your spiritual achievements. Getting Jannah is not about like, hey, like LinkedIn for Muslim, like Fedra this morning, right? Sadafa yesterday, you know, like sponsored an orphan tomorrow. You know, like that's not what a person does. What a person does, the way that we know that we're getting closer to Allah is that we actually become happier when something is done hidden from the eyes of people. You know, uh, Omar bin Khattab is a very famous statement. He said that a person knows that they're sincere when they try as hard to hide their good just like they hide their mistakes. Like, I'm going to go out of my way to make sure you don't see me doing the right thing. Just like I'm going to go out of my way to make sure that you don't see me doing the wrong thing. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. I always have a debate on this whole topic because okay. in our society... We show off the bad aspects like, oh, look at my new jeans, I want to show that off. But no, mm-hmm. you don't find a lot of teenagers or this generation showing off like volunteering or donations and yeah. all of that. When you try to protect that, but you also want to say, hey, this is cool too. Helping out other people is cool too. Yeah. How do you preserve your like intentions in me as far as, Ya Allah, please preserve this that I'm not trying to show off, but I also want to encourage other people to do that. It's a very good point. Very good point. Part of what it means to be socially beneficial to others is by setting examples. Right? Um, I mean, why am I streaming this? It's like a, it's like a, knee, it's like a, a crowbar to the kneecap of my sincerity, right? It's like, be sincere, everybody. Hey, can you hit the live button? Right? Like, you know, it's like the worst thing ever. But I'll explain. The scholars have said, okay, well, how do you, how do you deal with this? And actually they said, well, let's say that a person never wants to pray in public. Let's say that it's time for, you know, a person can think, well, I could go to the masjid or I could pray at home. Because if I go to the masjid, people are going to see me. And I'm going to think to myself, wow, everyone's seeing you, right? So Ibn al-Qayyim and others, they said, basically, the, res- the, the response to this, and of course Imam Ghazali said this, they said that whatever you do in public has to be a fraction of what you do in private. The issue with our generation is that we do a fraction and we show it as if it's what we do all the time. Right? And, and I'm including myself in that. Right? So it's like, hey guys, fasted. Fasted on Monday. As if I fast every Monday. When that was like the first time in 17 years I fasted out of Ramadan. Right? And I show it as if it's like my norm, but in fact it is exceptional. So what the scholars say is, make your norm private. Like people should not know that you make wudu before you go to sleep and you sit at the corner of your bed, and you face Mecca, and you open your hands, and you ask Allah. People should not know that. People can know that the next morning you went and fed people. That's fine. As long as the time you spent feeding people was minuscule in comparison to the time you spent with Allah privately. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, if I want to be able to protect my sincerity, i got to make sure that I'm not taking away from things I'm doing publicly, because like you said, it's very motivational. Some of you only come here because your friends come here. Which is, I'm not offended, right? But single teardrop. No, I'm joking, right? <laughs> I'm not. That's fine. I've been, hey, do you want to go pray uh, Isha tonight? Yeah, let's go. Right? I wasn't going to go until you asked me. Let's go. Right? Hey, do you want to go to Tarawiyah? Yeah, let's go. I wasn't going to go, but you asked me, so let's go. That's okay, right? Some of you only come, but at the same time that we do that publicly, in private, we got to make sure that we bump up that database of things that we do. Right? So keep the sincerity strong by keeping things private. Keep stuff between you and Allah. Everyone in here has that one friend that they have where no one else knows the secrets that you have between you. Right? There's a friend that you have where you can look across the room and look at them and you just start laughing. Right? Because you are sharing, like you give them like that gym from the office space where you're like, right? Like, you just give them that and then they start laughing. Because you have something between you that's so close, no one else will even know it. In fact, even if you articulated it, it wouldn't make sense. Have that with a lot. Maybe it's not comedic. Maybe it's something deep and personal. But... People should not know everything that you talk about with Allah, right? That should be somewhat sacred, right? Somewhat sacred, okay? So make sure that you force yourself to do stuff in private. That's going to build up this self-discipline. Why? Because we all have an appetite for praise. We all have an appetite to be appreciated. And so it's very normal for me to be like, how can I, even secretly, how can I somehow make sure that this leaks so that 
right? I, someone can find out that I did good. It's like this internal nafsi thing. Hey, do you have an accountant? Yeah, sure, why? I had a lot of these deductions, man. It's like, from what? It's charitable, charitable person. <laughs> you know, you give a lot of charity, actually, the government, I found out this year that if you give over $50,000, it's like, well, how'd you find that out, right? And, and so, maybe going out of your way to try to hide the good that you do. Not saying, oh, look at me, I'm a horrible person, but be somebody who just kind of floats on the radar. Right? Just kind of right, you know, just right there. Okay? So include action, action that's done in the absence of witnesses or action done purely for his love or out of awe of his majesty. So they say that every action has three levels. The first is so that you can protect yourself from some punishment. Right? So I don't want to go to hell, so I'm going to pray. The second is so you can gain some reward. I don't want to, you know, I want to, I want to get, to gen- get to Genesis, so I'll pray. And the third level, the highest level, is that even though you know that there's a result to what you're doing, that it's going to protect you from the hellfire, and it's going to put you in Jannah, you still do it because you love Allah. Like, the first thing on your mind is not hell or heaven, it's just Allah. I'm just doing this because of Allah. And we all have moments with our friends where maybe we've done something for them, and it wasn't because we were afraid of them talking about us, and it wasn't because we wanted some sort of reward or gift or favor. We just did it because we loved them. That's sincerity. You feel this actually most with your close family and your close friends, right? So, doing stuff for the sake of Allah, okay? If I don't have stuff that's for the sake of Allah sincerely, go home tonight and write down, what are some things that no one else knows that I do that's good for the sake of Allah? If I don't have a list that's somewhat, you know, has some substance to it, i got to work on that before Ramadan. And Ramadan is the perfect time to bump up that list, okay? The purest deed, go ahead. The purest deed is that done by someone free of worldly wants. The opposite of this is the debt of the, co- is the, debt of the covetous one, whose endeavors are ultimately insignificant. Yeah, so the best deed is somebody who literally has no attachments. They're just doing it for the sake of Allah. There's no favor that's going to be re- responded to. The opposite is the one who literally does it only for the sake of benefiting something. The deed of the person who wants something is ultimately, it has no weight. Right? It's like currency that's worth nothing. Okay? Continue. Uh, the actions. The actions of those who strive out of hope are more... Uh, Resplendent and exalted than one whose striving is compelled by fear. Mm. What does this mean? The actions of those who strive out of hope are more resplendent and exalted than those whose striving is compelled by fear. Translate this for us. From English to English. So, doing something because you're like uh, worried that you're going to get hurt or you're doing it out of fear versus... Um, <coughs> doing it because you're hoping Allah will reward you. Yes. So this is the secret to actually being sincere. The secret to being sincere is that you don't do things only out of fear. Is that you somehow find it within yourself to do things out of the hope for Allah. You know how the Prophet ﷺ was described? So this means that all of us, when it comes to spiritual motivation, we should focus on what? The hopeful side of things, not the fearful side. The Prophet ﷺ was actually described as Bashira wa Nadira, in that order. The first description that Allah gave him was Bashir. Bashir means the one who gives good news. Nazir is the one who gives what? Some sort of warning. Why didn't Allah describe him as the warner and then the one who gave good news? Why did he choose this order to describe the Prophet Huh? Absolutely. Positivity first. Imagine if the Prophet got up on the Mount of Safa every day and said, Hey everybody, hell is real. <laughs> like, you're going to burn <laughs> Unless you pray Like, what, what's the default that a person has When they engage And I don't even have to ask in theory How many of us, that was our religious experience Right? Absolutely, in some place, some shape or form And for those who want, it wasn't, may Allah you know, protect you Right? But the idea is like a fire and brimstone preacher That this is what you have to be worried about This is what you have to be worried about SubhanAllah, you know what's crazy? Over time a person who is constantly focused on fear, they eventually lose any sensitivity to it. Whatever they were scared of doesn't work anymore. But hope never runs out. Hope never runs out. There's always this aspiration. There's actually like data done on this. That hope is like a slow burning oven. It doesn't work quickly. It doesn't start quickly. But it cooks something so perfectly. But fear is like a microwave. Right? And you got... I, I hate when I microwave stuff. You guys ever use microwave frequently? 
like part of it's like lava, the other part's still like an ice cube, right? Yeah, right? It doesn't do things properly. It doesn't do things appropriately. It doesn't do things well. And so when a person wants to have a good relationship with Allah, don't base your relationship in fear. And some of us who have like that dissonance with Allah, part of the reason why that's there is because it's been so fearful. There hasn't been enough hope involved, right? So he's actually even saying, make sure that you use hope over fear, okay? Now, Sheikh Hamza, we're going to finish, inshallah, what time is it right now? It's 9.30? Okay, we'll finish Shalah five minutes. I just want to finish with this discussion that he gives us. When speaking of purification of the heart, it is important to know that purification is not a state, but an ongoing process. No one's going to leave this reading of this text being like, oh, I'm purified now. It's something that you're learning. It's a roadmap that you're developing so that you can become closer to Allah. It's a process. Just as we go through the day worried about our bodily cleanliness, we must similarly tend to our spiritual purity for purification and sincerity do not survive a passive relationship. These are not things that exist simply because we just let them. There has to be some investment into it. You have to have some maintenance with your soul. If a person doesn't maintain their soul, it's the same thing like a person doesn't maintain their car or their espresso machine, right? It ends up falling apart. It ends up becoming destroyed over time. It destroys itself. They are not qualities that are ignited and glow on without attendance. For that reason... Imam Mawlid states that what is most beneficial for the purification of the heart are those acts that are done with consistency, even if they are small, which is based on the hadith like we said. Um, okay, let's talk about... Okay, this is powerful. This is what I want to finish on, actually. Okay, the Prophet Wasallam, who can read this, was a universal prophet. Anyone want to read? Yeah, go ahead. The Prophet wasallam was a universal prophet, which means, among other things, that he was an example for all people. Does anyone read and hear all the things the Prophet wasallam did, and you become like super impressed, but at the same time super overwhelmed? Mm-hmm. So you're like, wait a second, he did all of this, and then people are like, follow the Prophet, and you're like, how? <laughs> <laughs> right? You're like, I first thing is I have to find this animal that'll take me from Mecca to Jerusalem, right? <laughs> you know, like, there's so many things that you're just like, how am I going to accomplish this, you know? He used to pray all night, then he used to fast all day, then he used to hang out with his friends, then he used to make du'a, then he used to help the needy. Like, literally, he used to do everything. So, Sheikh Hamza addresses this, right? Go ahead. He was a universal prophet. He fasted and broke his fast. He prayed and rested. So it's interesting because you used to have people who would come to the Prophet ﷺ and they would say, out of their like their excitement, I'm going to be the best Muslim ever. I'm going to fast every day. I'm going to pray every day. I'm never going to get married. I'm just going to focus on my religion all the time. <laughs> no, literally, there was a thing who said, I'm never going to get married because I don't want to be distracted, right? And the Prophet ﷺ, actually, that story, they never actually made it directly to the Prophet ﷺ. They said this to Aisha. And Aisha, anha, she, she, she told her husband later, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi because he wasn't in town. So she said to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she said, these three guys came looking for you and they said that they're going to do these, these three things. If it wasn't that serious, you can imagine the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being like, it's okay, like, they'll figure it out eventually. You know, like, it's not realistic. When he heard this, he said, call them immediately. Who were they? So she had to remember and she had to find them, send out like this, this message, hey, find those three dudes. Bring him back. The Messenger of God wants to talk to them. So the Prophet told them, he asked them, he said, what are you guys planning on doing? They told him, I'm never going to break my fast. I'm going to fast every day. One person said, I'm never going to sleep. I'm going to pray all night. One person said, I'm never going to get married so I can just focus on my religion. The Prophet told them, literally responded with these. He said, I'm a prophet of God. Okay, and this is not him bragging. You read the translation and you're like, why is he talking like that? This is him telling them, you don't have to do this to yourself. I'm the messenger of God, and he says, some days I fast, and some days I eat. Some nights, or part of the night I pray, and part of the night I sleep. And he said, hello, you talked to my wife. I'm married, right? Like, you're trying to outdo the messenger of God. You're trying to outdo the Prophet Wasallam. So, what's the wisdom in the Prophet Wasallam not being like Angel Jibreel? What's the wisdom in him not fasting every day? What's the wisdom in him sleeping part of the night? What's the wisdom in these things? Is that... Go ahead. The life of Prophet Wasallam has something for people of diverse strengths and weaknesses for everyone. No one should feel like the Prophet Wasallam cannot relate to them. No one should feel like that. So tomorrow when you don't fast, be like, hey, the Prophet Wasallam didn't fast some days. Cool, I'm following the Sunnah today, right? <laughs> I'm dead serious. And then make the intention to fast. Be like, I'm not fasting every day because the Prophet Wasallam didn't fast every day. 
right? But then you have to fast at least like once. <laughs> okay, after Ramadan, okay? So everyone should have their own individual relationship with the Messenger of Allah. Everybody. You know, he had a sense of humor. He enjoyed eating certain kinds of food for all of us foodies, right? He enjoyed poetry for all of us artists. He enjoyed his family. He enjoyed working hard. Right? These are the things that the Prophet enjoyed. He was in great shape for you gym people, right? For us gym people, huh? Right? <laughs> he was in great shape, right? He was, mashallah, in, 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 they said that his, his stomach was completely flat. Like he was in remarkable shape, Ayatul Salam. At the age, you know, at, at a much later age, he wrestled people much younger than him and pinned them in, in two seconds, right? You're like, well, the angel's helping him? No. It was, it was a him, right? So you can relate to him. And you can find stuff that you're doing in your life that relates to the Prophet Right? So don't think or don't let anybody tell you that you have no connection to this man. You do. He's your messenger. He's your prophet. You have a relationship with him. Go ahead. For example... For example, God opens the hearts of some people so that they incline to perform night prayer. Yeah, some people, they can just pray at night. Right? MashaAllah. For others, He opens their hearts to recitation of the Qur'an. Some people just love Qur'an. Some people, they're just like, man, I can listen to Qur'an all the time. When they hear it, they like crumble. They just start, the eyes start watering up. It's usually like aunties, mashallah, man. Aunties are like just sincerity machines, bro. Okay, go ahead. For others, yeah, it may be that they are inclined towards being generous. Some people don't fast, don't pray, don't do nothing, but they're like, they give tons of money to people. Right? They just, they just like, they're like, here, what do you need? What do you need? Right? Go ahead. Others may find their hearts inclining towards consistent remembrance of God. And some people aren't special in anything, but when you talk to them, they are always remembering Allah. They're always saying Alhamdulillah. They're always saying SubhanAllah. They're always saying MashaAllah. Like you wouldn't mark this person as being like, oh, this person's particularly generous. Or this person's particularly they pray a lot or they listen to the Quran or anything. But this person, every time they talk, it's like Allah's name is flowing out of their lips. Right? There's the one story about the man who forgave all grudges. And the companions actually said about this person, you know, he walked in the masjid, the Prophet ﷺ described him as what? I told the story before. As a person from the people of Jannah. And when he walked in, the companions described him as being not remarkable. They were like upset that he wasn't uh, like this super looking person. And when they asked him, when they eventually, you know, investigated the situation, they said, you know, the Prophet ﷺ said that you're a man from the people of Jannah, like you're guaranteed paradise. And he gave the most frustrating answer. You know what he said? He goes, huh, I have no idea why he would say such a thing. <laughs> like this was his answer. They were all like trying to figure it out and they were like, okay, fine, look, the Prophet said you were a person of paradise. Why is it? And he's like, really? And then he thought about it and he said, you know what? He goes, I don't do anything normal. And in fact, the companion who spent time with him said, you know, he didn't do anything normal. Like he didn't pray extra. I pray more than him. He didn't make a dhikr more. I made more dhikr than him. But the companion said, I asked him and he told me, the only thing I do is every night I forgive anyone that's wronged me. I forgive them. And I ask Allah to forgive them. And that was enough that the Prophet ﷺ said, this person is guaranteed paradise. Find your specialization. What's your specialty going to be? Go ahead. Fasting is the love and passion of some people. And others love memorizing hadith and teaching it. Yeah, so sometimes we actually make mockery of people who like reading and studying Islam. Like, no, dude, that could be their way in. Jannah has multiple paths. Go ahead. There is much in Islam and in the beautiful model of the Prophet ﷺ that, mu- that one may learn from. Very rarely do we find a person who encompasses all, or even most, of his qualities. However, if a person finds himself inclining to a certain... Super... Super... Whoa. Super rogatory. Super rogatory worship. It means, it means like extra. <laughs> oh. Extra so worship, extra, right? It's so extra to use that word. Go ahead. <laughs> Superrogatory worship, right? He should follow it and remain consistent in its practice. Imam Malik said, God has opened up for his servants doors of goodness. For some, he opens doors of fasting. For others, he opens doors of charity. Others yet, doors of knowledge and teaching. And for others, doors of abstinence and, con- and contentment. And I am pleased with what God has opened up for me in educating people. So Imam Malik was like this baller teacher in Medina who used to teach hadith of the Prophet ﷺ to people in Medina. They used to travel all over the world. So one time there was a person who wrote a letter to him. And this person was from a particularly spiritual, ascetic cut of cloth. So Imam Malik was very rich. Imam Malik basically would shop at North Park. Right? Okay? And the, people who, the person who wrote the letter to him, 
would not, okay? And not because they couldn't, but because they saw this kind of wealth as being a distraction from the world. So they challenged Imam Malik, and they said to him, you're very knowledgeable. You do a lot of good. You know, you should be a man of God. You should be wearing thick, rough wool. You should be eating rice and lentils. You shouldn't be having meat, etc., etc. Because Imam Malik used to wear a new piece of cloth, a new piece of clothes every day. Wow. Goals. Right? So, but then they asked him why, and he said, I want to honor the words of the Prophet. He said, I don't want to teach the words of the Messenger wearing the same thing twice. Because it's his word. It's the Messenger of God. I want to be, basically when I know that I'm going to be meeting something important, meeting somebody important, I dress well. I'm going to be teaching the Hadith of the Prophet, I have to dress well today. And he wanted to dress well every single day for the sake of the Prophet. He used to teach Hadith of the Prophet, leaning on the grave of the Prophet. Wow. He used to say, Qala sahibu had al qabr. So he used to narrate the whole chain and he would say, and the person who the companion of this grave said, Imagine this the heart of that man. That Allah allowed him to teach hadith resting upon the resting place of the messenger of God. So someone wrote him a letter and they're like, Yeah, that's all good, but you should be like a really like ascetic person. And this is his response. He said, Allah has given us so many ways to get to him. Why are you limiting it to one? And he said, you can come through him through fasting, through charity, through prayer and knowledge. He goes, I'm happy being a teacher. That's what I'm good at. I may not be good at dressing down. I may not be good at fasting every day. But I'm happy being a teacher. So the lesson in this is that a person should never discount what their path to Allah is. Everyone in this room has their own unique individual relationship with Allah. Don't discount that. Highlight that. Discover it. Maybe it's hidden from you. Maybe you don't know what I'm talking about. Maybe you're like, what is he talking about? This Ramadan especially, and this class especially, polish the heart to figure out what it is that's going to connect you to Allah. What is the thing that you want to get close to Him through? And highlight that thing. It could be charity. It could be reading more. It could be being good to your parents. These are all things that are going to be passed to Allah. And this is what He's talking about. Okay? Um... Okay, we'll conclude there, inshallah, because it's already pretty late. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to purify all of our hearts. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to practice everything that we've learned. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us value our relationship with Him. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cure us from all the ailments that we've talked about. We also ask Allah to cure us from all the ailments that we haven't had time to talk about. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make the solution for our problems clear for us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the courage to be able to follow the solution. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the strength to be able to worship Him appropriately and to be close to His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take care of all of our deficiencies and to hide all of our flaws and to give us strength to do things correctly. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us faith with, with which we walk on. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to trust Him, to trust Him in all affairs and to not trust ourselves over Him in any single affair of our life. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us good people. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us good souls and have pure hearts. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept all of the du'a'at that we've been making as long as it is good for us. And if we've asked for anything that is harmful for us, we ask Allah to replace it with something better that is something that will for- make us forget how much we wanted the thing that was harmful for us. Mm-hmm. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to only give us good, to protect us from all evil, and to give us the strength to overcome any challenges that we're going through. If anyone has anything happening at work, we ask Allah to give you strength. If anyone's taking any exams, we ask Allah to give you amazing grades. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant everybody in this room their deepest and most secret need that only He can grant them. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant it to them. Amin, Rabbil Alameen. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastav firiku an tubi So, real quick before we wrap up, uh, next week, inshallah, will be our final uh, heart work. Um, inshallah. Well, it's our final of the first series. Heart work is the ongoing series. That's what we're doing. Um, it's the final of the session of ailments and remedies. And it's going to be a conversation on repentance. And um, it's going to be really, 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 really good. It's from a different book, uh, inshallah. So I, I want to, inshallah, make sure to invite everybody to come through to our conclusion. And as it's our conclusion, inshallah, uh, we're hoping to do something really special uh, with from food, from everything. So uh, please make it out, inshallah. I promise I'm going to turn the AC on to 55. <laughs> By the way, I set the AC to 64 at 3 p.m. Like, I pump it. It's like a refrigerator. Yeah, like, like uh, Hadra came early, and she actually was cold, and she's like, well, I know in an hour it's going to be like a sauna. 
So the good news is, we all lost a ton of water weight tonight. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, right? And, uh, you know, whatever heat we feel in this room, may Allah make it a proof that we don't feel heat in the afterlife. Amen. Inshallah. Inshallah. Amin. So I'll see you guys, inshallah, next week. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum. Can you see the lines? Why do you have to record this the last two minutes? Yeah, or I mean, they're right here.